Hi, I'm Peachy. And I'm Jeff. We're maybe going on to other names in the future, which will be Space Marine Sergeant Head and Space Wolf Upgrade Spirit. Gonna look like a mouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did the cat noise. <laughs> that was sheer panic. Sorry. <laughs> Right then, so we're back to have another little chat, aren't we? Another chat, um, more deep downs of peachy. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh Don't sounds do like that. something I need to put gloves on for that. <laughs> oh. That's for undercoating. And a miner's helmet with a lamp. Cavernous. <laughs> and maybe a wetsuit. Who's... Wetsuit. 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 <laughs> it's an echo in here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we thought we'd have a little bit more of a chat about the Willy Wonka chocolate factory that is <laughs> Games Workshop. Yeah, I suppose it has that vibe, yeah. Yeah. There you go, it's full of treats and surprises. Yeah. And an evil demon man. No, oh, that's oh. just a tunnel, isn't it, with a weird, crazy guy. Yeah, that's the one. That's yes. the one I remember. Isn't it? Yeah. So, we touched on last time uh, being at the Derby store yep. and then eventually running the Derby store and then moving over into being... Uh, on the army pace team and then managing mm. your own section within section the... oh it's your military uh, experience <laughs> yeah, coming comes out, out. There, isn't it? <laughs> became a section commander of a team that would storm the lines of unpainted miniatures yeah, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> that's like I wrote that it, it, it did sound it's like you wrote that no, just straight, profound straight. it should be on your grave uh, <laughs> yeah oh, I'm never going to be storming the lines of unpainted miniatures have you seen my <laughs> My Aldi bags of life just full of them. Aldi bags of life. That's what they are. They're just full of me life. They're not for life. They're just Aldi bags of life. They're just full of bits of me life. Well, we all know that if you paint all your models, you die. Uh, apparently so, so. That's what I've heard. It, yeah. it kind of that's fits, why I've just really. taken it. If, it carry, if, that's, if that's true, I should wake to the ripe old age of about 190. Oh, good. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> so then you went on to Army Painter. And then from uh, working on the Army Painter team, you then on, went on and then you were right there at the very beginning of uh, of the YouTube painting, weren't you? Not quite. Uh, just, Duncan had been doing it Duncan. for a couple of years before that point. Oh, right. Uh, okay. And then I, I, I just tagged on later because I got bored of managing. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then he went from there. But um, what, what do you think you, uh, what would you say was, uh, when it comes to managing, mm. Without sounding awful, but what would you say would probably have been the high points and the low points of being a manager of Games Workshop? Ooh, I think there was two. There yeah. was a high point of managing at the Derby Store. Yeah. Because um, I really enjoyed it, because I had a great team. Uh, I th I th I, this is the, the biggest thing for me, is I never expected to see myself as a manager. I was always just like happy just to get on, do my job. And every now and again, someone was like, oh, you're quite good at that. Maybe you should look at being a manager. And I was like, I've never really thought about it, <laughs> but then, as we touched on in the last show, we did the management training, which is quite a robust yeah. uh, training um, scheme, if you like, um, which is a shame they don't do it anymore because it made some really good managers. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't never well, consider how, myself. How are well managers made now then? Uh, do they hire them in? As, as it's a, a weird one. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you get like um, externals. Um, this is, I, I guess, this is like um, a bit of a prelude before we delve yeah. deeply. I think. Because Workshop has moved from being a small business to like a larger business. Yeah. Almost, I hate to use the word corporation, but it, it, but it is. It's moving into yeah. that kind of. Th there's a lot of things that need to change from small business mentalities to bigger business mentalities, and sometimes you have to hire externals that know that, that know how to manage big teams, know how to manage marketing or whatever. Um, but there is still a little bit of hiring your mates goes yeah. on a bit, which used to be a lot back in the day, but certainly from retail and my experience when I was doing the retail management, they, they did have design studio people going on these courses. Um, so they did take it seriously. And I remember actually we had a conversation, um, a whole bunch of us when we were in our region, because we used to break up the, the UK into different regions and each region had a cell. This is retail. And um, workshop used to be seen as like the pinnacle of staff training and customer service and other companies would come and ask how they go about doing it because we used to have really good customer service in the oh, store right, okay. and we had a really robust management training scheme um, which baffles me why it doesn't exist anymore um, it, it's bizarre but that putting that aside I I think my experiences was a lot of learning so when I if I go if I do two separate parts here like retail yeah, it's yeah. very different 
some similarities, but very different to, to managing a, a creative team in a design studio. So retail was very much like numbers based. You, you've got to make money. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, what's the point in you being there? Yeah. And the interesting thing about workshop is a lot of the stores, you'd every now and again, like Meadow Hall, it would be smack in the middle of like a multiplex shopping centre. Um, and they're like zone one kind of shops. Most of Games Workshop shops were what they called the tertiary zone in like cities and towns, which was yeah. on the peripherals of a town. And it was more of a destination store. So people would go there. You didn't rely on footfall. And it was this weird notion, I suppose, that you don't want just every Tom, Dick and Harry coming in and waste and your staff wasting time on people that are not going to purchase it. You want people that know it or word of mouth are aware of it. Yeah. And that's the people you focus on. Well, that's it, isn't it? You're absolutely right. When if you are, for want of a better term, a niche yeah. thing, you can put your store anywhere. And I, one of my routes to work, it's not there anymore, but right in the middle of a suburban area, there used to be a Bang & Olufsen. Oh, tech, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I remember my wife saying to me, she said, what a weird place. And I went, what a weird place to have a shop like that. And I went, it's not, because if you buy Bang & Olufsen, You'll just drive to wherever the shop yeah, is. Yeah. You don't need to walk past it and go, oh, do you know what I was thinking about? A 12 grand, 12 grand <laughs> high price system. Get out of the old wallet. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? You go there because yeah, you're going yeah. there, aren't you? You know, and, and you're right. But it must be tiring when, isn't that nicely, but must be tiring when you're dealing with just nosy curiosity type. Yeah, I, I saw that when I worked at Meadow Hall. There was a lot of people who just didn't know what it was. And you put a lot of effort into running intro games and then nothing would come from it. So yeah. there's a lot of time wasted, which is why I understood why you'd have it on the peripheral. Do you ever feel like sometimes in Meadow Hall it was just like somewhere to show for the kids? Yeah, oh yeah. Every store had that. Yeah. We, we used to have like parents that would just drop their kids off because they thought we were all like a nanny service. <laughs> I, honestly, they did. I mean, Come I, back for the kids later, drunk. I, I did lose my temper <laughs> with, with one of the dads because he used to do it every Saturday morning. He'd leave his kid and he'd just wander off and get coffee. And I found out the kid was seven. I was like, that's just, I mean, I'm a parent. Yeah. I'd never leave my seven-year-old in a in a building full of people I don't know. No, it's ridiculous. I've never met it? in my life. But obviously the kid liked what we did. And we, we always looked after him and made sure we kept an eye on him. But we, we weren't paid to do that. That's not our no, job. No, but we, right, yeah. we felt duty-bound to look after him while I was in there. But I just had to have a word with the dad at the end. I was like, you can't just dump him and leave him. If you yeah. do, I'll inform the authorities. Yeah. You're just abandoning your child. He never came in again. Yeah, go. You can, you can <laughs> abandon your child, here, but when you, <laughs> but when you come to collect them, they're expected to be spending at least ninety quid. <laughs> <laughs> That's our service charge. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, you've come to collect your child, and here's the Land Raider and Army Box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah um, the managing side of things was was so I I learned on the job. I think. Yeah. That was that was the big thing. So you, you you fed all this information. You do like some practical stuff, like I did at Meadow Hall. And then once that's all done, it's like, yep, yeah, you're good enough. Off you go. And then you're given the store. I had to learn things like what the hell like for like meant. What was net? What was gross? Yeah. So you had, you had like your books. You had to keep them going. You had to always be. That I think the rule was like fifteen percent growth each month. Um, and obviously you had to. And the drivers for that were intro games and core core game sales. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we were at the time, and I think there was a bit of a shift because we weren't sort of massively. We're going to say this: we 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 would get people excited about the product, mm -hmm. and chilled out about it, but then that kind of wish and hope that they come back and buy it. Yeah. Um, but you can't run a business on wish and hope. No. <laughs> So they end up becoming. I know that from the amount of times I've had quiet days, and I'm just like against the glass, <laughs> just looking at people going past with long hair, just wishing they would come in yeah, for a haircut. Yeah, so you did become very sort of. You had certain numbers. You always it. stayed away because I think because I, I was always naked. Oh, if I'd have been yeah. leaning against the window with clothes on, they might. Have I mean, that's probably why we went wrong in Derby. Yeah, we, we should probably like you know cut down on the nudity a bit more. Mm, and just yeah, know. maybe that's probably what it was. And the smell. Bit of a slunnish. <laughs> bit of yeah. <laughs> Oh God! The bit retail a, smell. Bit of a slanesh heavy store, yours. <laughs> oh yeah, it was actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was a big <laughs> slanesh fan. Yeah. A few people tell tell you stories about the cabinets and the models they used to oh, paint. I, I, um, that. I've got, uh, I've got, uh, I, 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 I used to use a um, a really good comic store, store in the centre of Nottingham, quite a lot. And you would walk into the store and you would walk past somebody and as soon as they went, you think, oh, Jesus Christ, bless them, they're not getting out the house much. And as soon as they left and the, the member of staff would just look and go, yeah, and the door is closed and psh. Yeah. Oh, you see, that's polite. We were told to do it to them. <laughs> so we, we had the just, Ten Commandments. Just glazed, glazed them as they stood there, <laughs> just in the eyes. I suppose when you look back, it was, it was a bit, 
wrong to ask that of staff because you had the Ten Commandments, which was like awareness, acknowledge people coming in the store, be aware of the behaviour, you know, where, which, which se- section of the shop are they going to? They're going to 40k, they're going to Warhammer. Then you, once they've gone to one of those, it's like, right, they're not interested in 40k. These are the things I need to talk about. And there was like a whole load of things like build a rapport. Yeah. But the best one was maintain personal hygiene, not for yourself, but for them too. Oh. So there used to be a lad, and it wasn't his fault, but he'd come in and he'd, he'd smell. And the thing yeah. is, it's like Saturday, so you're getting parents coming in, you get the warm smell. And it, and, it, and, the, and, it, and it immediately going things. I don't know if this is some a, a hobby I want to introduce my children to. Yeah, yeah. You know. So yeah, you know, we always had a can of like Lynx or Dove, <laughs> and it would just be like, Sam. I would stand behind that door. Can you just spray yourself, please, mate? Because yeah. you don't want to put people off. And the funny but thing he is, knew he got to the point where you understood why we did it. Because it's you had funny to explain it, but it was it was such a weird, uncomfortable thing that you had to do. It's a weird thing, isn't it? Because you think it comes like a stereotyped. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. It's it, like it oh, you know, that. smelly geeks. They don't get out yeah. the house. They don't interact with women, so they don't look after themselves and all. And you go, and it seems on paper like a really lazy, easy stereotype, but it's more real than you. Yeah, it's a, such more of a real thing than than you know, you know. <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't be like this, but for a time it was very male centric. Yeah, yeah. And whenever the sister of a brother would come in the store, everyone was just like, oh, "There's a woman in here. What do we do?" Well, I, I worked for an electricity. <laughs> I worked for an electricity company, and I was leaving. And when I was leaving, um, they said to me. Um, oh, oh, was I leaving, or was it was my bed? I can't remember anyway. We used to have big whip rounds for things. And uh, a good friend of mine, and she still is this day, a good friend of mine, Vicky, she worked, she, she worked with me. And Vicky's really pretty, very raven-haired looking girl. And, and um, she said, oh, what, go on, what do you want from Games Workshop for, like I say, for whatever the, the event was. And I said, and it was the starter box for Inquisitor. Well, the starter blister is actually oh, one. Yeah, wasn't yeah, it? yeah. And she come back, and when she gave me, and I opened it on the day she went, it's a bit weird that place, isn't it? And I went, what, what do you know? And I'm like, no, 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 it's like it's like my church. What's weird about it? Do <laughs> what's weird about it? She went. She said, seems to be a lot of people in there that don't seem to know what women are. <laughs> <laughs> he said it took the man behind the counter about twelve minutes to just try and figure out how to ask me to take money off me. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a funny. It's a weird. It has this weird connotation to it, where it, on paper it sounds like you're writing a comedy show. Yeah, but yeah. it's all blatantly yeah, true, yeah. isn't yeah, it? It's yeah. really I mean, odd. It, it, I think it, the the hobby certainly at that time was very sort of drawn to to lads and, and males and stuff. But that that was never to say that anyone else couldn't do it. It's just when you had so many in the shop, it was I guess off putting. Yeah. To a certain point, because I was off, I was put off for a long time. Um, because I used to, I had to do this as a job. I used to hate it when the staff member would pound it on you. Literally just pounding it. Hi, how are you doing? How can I help? I'm like, just leave me alone. I, I come I, across as being someone quite extrovert, but I'm actually quite introverted. I just want to be left alone and look at a shop in my own time. Do you know what I always loved with that was when um, when I uh, I moved out of games where I was playing uh, GW-based products and I went into playing Confrontation by Rackham and mm. I went into playing Infinity by Corvus Belly. Because I knew them, I still mostly worked in Citadel Paints because mm. I knew them, you know. And I always loved that was when you would go into the, my local store, being the Friar Lane store, and you'd go in and they'd go, hello there. And you go, hello. You know, <laughs> like somebody <laughs> appeared out of nowhere, you know, at least like they just jumped out of the shelf at you. Go, what are you painting at the moment? You know, because you've stood there and you've got like a, you go, and I used to go, oh, I'm painting, um, I'm painting the, uh, Ariadna Army for Infinity. Do you know it? Infinity, really great. Oh, no, no. Anyway, you just... I'll see you at the till when you're ready to go. <laughs> Can't talk about other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Don't talk about other games. <laughs> I mean, I suppose, from my point of view, as uh, managing the staff, I had to do a lot of that. Yeah. Like, lead by examples, like run intro games, talk to, to customers. And there was a great one where there's a guy who turned up to look at the paints. I don't think it was you. No. He went to uh, get some paints from the rag, and I was just like, oh, it's going to do some paints. So I just headed off towards him. I was like, yeah, buddy. What are you painting? And it, uh, just uh, again, I just not thought about how to, to to say it. It just came out like, "What are you painting then?" Yeah. And he's like, "Come on, love, we're going." <laughs> and I turned around. I was like, "That's not how you approach a customer." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, there was a lot of learning um, from myself and making mistakes. But I, I had a great team. I mean, Duncan was one of the staff members there. A guy called Neil, Nigel, uh, Andy, and Alex. Some of them were key time. I was key time to start off with, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was. Learning a lot, 
making mistakes, showing those mistakes being done because I had to. I, I was an extra. I was a staff member, so if it was like a Monday. I was the only person in. So yeah, I had to, I had to right, run yeah, intro games. Single, single yeah. people shop. Well, well, for a lot. Well, ours was probably about five, and we had two full timers and a manager, and like a bunch of key timers for like weekends and holidays. But obviously, you had days off during the week, not the weekend. Um, so, you uh, like Mondays would be super quiet. I'd run like the store on my own on a Monday. Tuesdays would be longer opening hours, so you need like split shifts. Yeah, yeah. One of you be in the morning to like evening time and one would be like lunchtime till night time um so a lot of the time you know you had to keep doing those things where you're running intro games talking to customers so you'd never lose the skill but you'd have to understand why you did those things so you communi- communicate to the to the staff and then you had to run training on those things as well but there's a difference between being someone that didn't take criticism and someone that was like i did that wrong and the guys have pointed it out. I don't. I shouldn't get offended by it because I did it wrong. I've been telling them to do it this way for so many months now, and I've just not done it that way. So I think one of the things I learned was just taking the hits when you get it wrong, yeah, and just accepting it and going, you know what, I'm screwed up there. That's not how to do it. <laughs> That's definitely so. Would you not class, how you do it? <laughs> would you class them in your to go back to the original question? Would you class? Um, managing a derby is one of your highlights or it was for a long time then there was a bit of a rocky time um because we moved from being like conversational hobby related stores getting people in and it, that, that it moved from being friendly hobby conversations to sales i've never really considered myself a salesy person i know technically i, I worked in warhammer tv and that is a marketing yeah product where you sell stuff but i still for me i was painting stuff but yeah but you it's not face to face yeah it? And, and i think the minute you lose the in you know, the minute you haven't uh, there isn't direct contact back from someone the sales changes yeah. you know what it? i think it was and this is why I, I think i enjoyed army painting more as a manager and as a staff member is i had control over the results oh right that's a good way of putting it yeah whereas in Derby, you had to rely on people walking by. And there was like conversations like, well, if you put more events on, more people will come down. But it's like, there's only so many people that will come down because it's a Monday morning at nine o'clock. So I don't know who you're expecting unless we get all the um, job seekers coming down. They ain't going to buy anything because there are job seekers allowance. Um, yeah. All the school kids have got to wait until the weekend for the parents to come in. So you can run as many as events as you want, have many reasons to come to the store. But a lot of it was still relying on people to spend money. And because I wasn't very sales orientated, I found that very hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the, the team did as well. And I'm, I, it, long story short, I moved to Warm World and then got a job painting armies in the studio. And I really enjoyed that and had a lot of control over the deadlines there and the, the results that you had to, they were, they were within my control. I could literally go, I can paint 140 euro kind of day now. I know I can do that because I've shown I can do it. I can paint this amount of figures up to this standard. Mm-hmm. When, when you became a manager at, uh, on the Army Painter team, did you still paint as well? For a, a, a good time, I found it hard not to because I'm a creative person. I like mm-hmm. making stuff. I think for me it was... A lot of my peaks, um, I guess, the most mem- rememberable, rememberable, momentous yeah. uh, moments were uh, when I've created something for a workshop and it stayed. So like the Nilec Dynasty, um, doing like different colour schemes for like Imperial Guard, doing different colour schemes for Space Wolves. Like, you know, we've got this company by... Um, it's Sven Bloodhow, we did a paint guide on him. I was like, you know, how do you make Space Wolves look a bit different to Space Wolves? Well, I'll put some markings on them. Yeah. I'll convert this guy to look a little bit different. Um, and when we did like all these other paint guides, I, I, you know, that kind of like creating stuff from nothing or having like a text or like a paragraph in a, in a book going, I'm going to turn that into an army. Um, I used to find those really, really valuable and rewarding. But when you become the manager, you, have, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. You have to stop. And then it becomes about the people themselves and getting that out of the people. And, and I reckon for a good six months, I was still painting. And obviously I got told by my manager that you, you can't keep painting. But some of it was because the workload was quite tight. I needed to help out anyway. Because even though we had 10 painters, we still had quite tight deadlines here and there. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, when, when you, you manage people to, to sell things or to put things on shelves and whether it be in, you know, in warehouses or whatever it is, 
there's a sort of general way that that works but what what are sort of like the challenges of like managing creatives because that's going to be a completely different way of yeah, yeah looking at things isn't it really so managing staff in retail you 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 have like your kpis your key performance indicators which yeah. is how many intros they've run so if someone like let's say duncan had did like 97 intros but only sold one core game there's something yeah. about his intro games that aren't line up with yeah, yeah. why people aren't buying them but he wasn't letting everybody just roll fours that's the problem yeah yeah <laughs> but the other side of it is someone's like got like two intro games but a hundred core games it's like well, you're getting someone else's sales there, so yeah, you, yeah. you need to push out more intro games. So it's, it, you, you look at the figures to work out how a staff member in, in the team's performing. Whereas with the army painters, because they're creative, everyone's got their own little style. You might not necessarily know it, and we try to paint armies so they all look very similar, like it's been painted by one person. Yeah. But everyone has their own style, speed, level, um, and idea of how things should look. And you, you would write a brief, and you'd have... Um, like a test model, this is the standard we're looking for, these are the markings, this is... And even there, you could have like a brief that's really ro in your head that's robust, um, and there's a model there to show it off, and you're there next to it. Someone's still going to get it wrong, because they still go a bit low and gun, so it's, it's trying to find out why that why that happened. Well, the, the, there's a bit there that fascinates me as well, is that if... And please correct me if I'm wrong. So when, especially if it's a new colour scheme for some place, it's a... I know it doesn't happen very often, but a whole new army yeah. or a new variant yeah. thereof. Because every time, a, virtually every time a codex is released, there is a the lads a new clan or cha well not chapter as much with marines because they're a bit steady. But they'll add like a new clan or the new house of this or that, and they'll they'll they'll, they'll add other things in. Some of them never get a paint scheme. You just mm. have to just make it up for yourself. But um. I assume when that all sorts of started, that comes down from from heavy metal. Yes, yes. And then, and then heavy metal, as we know, will have, even though <laughs> the back of the box doesn't seem to mention it, heavy metal will be they'll be glazing and shading yeah, yeah. and lots of things going on that until you literally almost put one of their miniatures under the microscope, yeah. you won't spot that there is a whole range of of sort of technical level of painting that it suggests isn't there but blatantly is yeah. so you have that and then army painting by its very nature isn't painted to that level of extremes because it's sitting that little bit further back who who does the translation where's that where's that done is that done by heavy metal or is that done by the army painter so who, who gets that middle ground early days um because i we used to sit literally next door to heavy metal I would just follow, like, Daz would write a brief. Daz Latham. Yeah, so again, I'm taking Skaven because it's just a nice memorable one because yeah. there was a lot of training went off with that. He'd write a brief for all the painters because he used to supervise the heavy metal painters back yeah. then before he went off to school. And he'd write a brief and out of all the colours and stuff like that. He'd also give me the brief, but I'd have to turn that into something that's a bit more achievable through, through speed. Um, so, like, the way that they'd highlight the reds would be, like, through, like, blends and like multiple highlights and glazes and I'll be like, oh, I'm just going to paint my fist in red and I'll shade it with that colour and I'll highlight it with that colour. So you cut out like three or four paints. So it, would, so it all came down to you basically. So uh, when I was on my own, yeah. it was. When we, we grew a little bit and it was like me, Duncan and Steve, um, we would have conversations amongst ourselves like, what would you think? Would that? And we'd do like, the odd test, but sometimes you'd have like, Duncan would do Iandan, Steve would be doing Undead and I'd be doing like lizard men. Mm -hmm. So you'd have your own project so it would be down to them to make those calls. And, and how, many, those how many would be in, if you were doing lizard men, say, for example, how many would be in your team? Oh, it's just me on my own. Oh, just so me on your own. Yeah, early yeah. days, I'd be doing a whole lizard man army on my own. Steve wow. would be all undead oh, army okay. on his own, and Doug would be, like, doing Iandan or... No wonder you're quick. <laughs> well, you have to be. You have to, I mean, there's a lot of cut, corner you, cutting. Would you have to send your formula back up? No, did, no. Or without I, I used to have a notebook. And yeah. what was really frustrating in the early days is we didn't have names for all the new paints. It was all code. So, right. so like a great example was, let's go for the yellows. Um, instead of base coat, they had F because originally I think they were going to call them foundation paints. But mm -hmm. Avalanche Sunset was F zero zero one, so foundation zero zero one. Yeah. And then Uriel Yellow was L zero zero two. Oh right, and, I got you. Um, Flash Gits, which is lighter, was L zero zero three. And I think Cassandra Yellow was W zero zero four. So you literally have all these codes, and I'd just be like base coat yellow. Egg yellow, bright yellow, 
and then eventually they got names and you had to like get used to names but in the early days i've just got like these notebooks of just code of like what i'm using for the base code what i'm using for the highlight and this that and the other so i i would have and even not before before i left i found a whole bunch of my notebooks they were of no use to me at that point because i forgot all the codes apart from like one or two but it was all the colour schemes for when I did the Lizard Men, the High Elves, the, the Necrons. Oh, that must be fascinating. So, yeah, it was all, but it was all like code. It was like skin, and there would like be some code. So when, when so for Heavy Metal, once they'd figured out their uh, colour scheme and then they sent it to you, for them then it was like fire it and forget, wasn't it? They, yeah, they, yeah, they gave the you it. Project. And then they, 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 they took no... Who ultimately then would be keeping an eye on the army painters who would be going who would be going on output who would be going or oh, where we need to be or get ready because we're going to be giving you this or who so we who had would... um schedulers and we had like um project leads usually mm -hmm. it'd be like um someone from games dev like matt ward for instance if we yeah. like necrons he'd be like project lead in it and he'd be checking who's doing what there'd always be someone around yeah always checking on your productivity but it was very much self-driven that was like i say wow. the early days of like when it was just a handful of army painters when it became a big team, they needed a supervisor, so I was the supervisor at the time. And, and again, I learned a lot here. I made lots of mistakes. Um, I kept trying different ways of like doing the schedules. Eventually, it just I, I found a way that worked for everyone, and it was just like a chart on Google Excel, and I'd have all the painters, and I'd have the workflow broken into days. The schedule itself worked in weeks, but you can't plan a project in, well, you can if you really wanted to, but the staff preferred like a day-to-day -day breakdown. So like a character would take a day, um, like rebasing an army might take a day and then like painting this bigger character might take three days. So that is like a week's worth of work. Was, was that also then something that you would do? Would you then take pre-existing army army level, army painted level miniatures and rebase them? Yeah, we had to. There's a few yeah. times when um, we um, moved from Warhammer to Age of Sigma, there was a lot of rebasing. Uh, there was a load of like when the 32 mil round bases came out. Yeah. Um, Marines went onto those, Necrons went onto those. Um, so there was a lot of like jigging around, rebasing stuff. But going back to the heavy metal thing, yeah. What we used to do was we never. So, so heavy metal would paint the box cover, yeah. And the best way I describe this is the burger picture in McDonald's yeah. or like yeah. Burger King. <laughs> Ah. And we all know that that burger picture is made of lies. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes, like the the cheese isn't even cheese. No, the cheese is, is like PVA. Slab, yeah, it's it's PVA a... mixed with something else and a bit of cheese. The yeah. actual and I've discovered this over time. The burger itself is it has a whole quarter cut out of it and water injected into it. Yeah, yeah. So the burgers you see look appetising. They're selling the product, but they're full of lies. And I'm not saying that the heavy metal painters are liars, they're not, but they do a lot of things that we don't show or they use colours that aren't available because they do a lot of mixing and stuff like that. But they make the box packaging look as good as it possibly could be. I would argue sometimes that they go a bit too far. Yeah. That it's actually like, mm, how do you do that? Um, <laughs> Can I just interject? I was telling Pat about this a while ago. Um, Friar Lane, because of it being the nearest store to Warhammer World, sometimes was looked after a little bit better than other stores. Yeah, yeah. Things came... they. I, you know, I've been in there before. Stay so where for I think it was for a week. They had an heavy metal painter was in the store, oh. and and he was painting um, the new Tyranids, and in an alternative color scheme, yeah. and all little things going on. And I remember them having uh, Eldar snipers, Rangers, yeah, Eldar Rangers. They had Eldar Rangers in a cabinet, and I was remember I I was in there nearly every day because I walked past it on my way home from work. And I was saying to one of the members of staff, I got on quite well, they went, oh, the Rangers are really good. And he went, opens the cabinet, and he took the Rangers out, and then he went like that, and he'd tear them all round, and the backs just weren't painted at all. <laughs> yeah. And I went, how would you do that? And he went, yeah, in, in White Dwarf, the only photograph, the front. Yeah, he said, yeah. that these weren't being used for any of the, it weren't being used for any of the battle reports. Yeah. He said, the backs were just like, just, Primed black yeah. or white depends on what they paint. A lot of the colour variants used to be like that. They'd only paint the front. And I get it because it's like you could it's spend so tight, two days it, yeah. doing the back that no one would see. So, yeah. Or just one day doing the front. See, I feel sorry for every metal painters on some levels now because now you go on the store, there's a 360 option. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the fact that now people can grab a miniature yeah. and blow it up as big as they want, yeah, you yeah. know, and you go, oh, you know, it must be, you know, it's like, you know, they said to me, like, um, Movie and TV makeup artists had to work so much harder when everything went 4K. Yeah. 
Nah, but there's at one point in time, you know, a spot covered in makeup you just wouldn't see, yeah, but yeah. now that you've got a television... I can see it. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I, think, I assume for every metal painters on some levels, I think... I, I, But in a weird way, I also think, and I, and I don't know whether you agree, I think um, it seems almost, whether it's officially, unofficially, or it's just by its very nature, that every metal seems to... Uh, I don't know if it's maybe because I'm not suggesting I'm a good painter, because we all know I'm not, but I'm suggesting... <laughs> Um, it, it, has there been a little bit of a, a a shift where I think lately heavy metal looks a little bit more achievable than it used to is that just because as we've got YouTube and there's so many great painters out there we all know a bit more than we used to and it doesn't seem quite as much black magic as it was or have they scaled back a little bit to not so to make it more, more direct sellable in a way? Uh, so for a long time this is uh, not like pointing fingers at anyone, but when you're in a team of creatives that are all very much experts in the field, everyone wants to show how good they are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think the problem there is you get like a, a schism going on where this person painted this two men of a Space Marine squad yeah. is going to go their own way, whilst this person here is going to go and show you this way. And then eventually, which is why if you look at like the Blood Angel army, all the squads and the the vehicles are all different tones of red yeah. because they all went their own way as opposed to being a combined unified group and going let's all work together to do this and i think some of that was just time people work in different situations or some people work from home some people working in the office because I, I i got this when we used to do like big events for games day where you you'd literally put out like across the region 10 stores this is how we we're going to base the models we're going to base them with sand we're going to paint them with scorch brown we're going to dry brush them with more than brown or not more than brown like a an ochre and they want to dry yeah, yeah. them with a bone colour every single squad that came from the different stores the bases look different no matter how clear and, I, and the reason why I discovered this was when we used to do the army paint when, as army painters um, they'd base their own squads in the end it, it became much easier for one person or two people to base everything yeah that makes sense because yeah. what you'd find is dull but it makes sense it is dull but every, everyone got to do it yeah. Um, but what you'd find is like the way I. Did you get double shift on that if you've been naughty? You're having another. <laughs> you're, you're getting an extra week on base. You've been another. naughty. Oh. Oh. But, if I see another grass tuft. <laughs> well, that's the other thing is that you could, you could like spread that out. So one person did dry brush and one person did tufting, one person did rimming. Oh. So, you know, you I've can, always you wondered really in life out. which I'd like to do I'd like to do more more rimming or more tufted it's in my life it's, I mean, each their own <laughs> 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 but one thing it did, it did become quite apparent which is why we got like one or two people doing it was how I would dry brush a base yeah. and how light or heavy I'd apply that dry brush someone would apply it really heavy or super light Yeah. so that's why it became so obvious like from doing the big games day kind of like um, collections and stuff where all the different stores did different bases even though it was all the same colours it, it became apparent to me as like it's about how much pressure because again when we're doing our videos yeah. it's like we I can put a script up and ha and you go off and paint it it will look different with, without watching the video yeah. your painted model will look different to my painted model well, because yeah, it's, the way you apply the paint well it's a creative thing isn't it yeah. you know, I say this to people um I say this to people all the time with regards to um, with with haircuts. I always say y you could take somebody and give give their and give their what they want for their haircuts as an instruction to ten different barbers. You could give an identical yeah. instruction, but you'll end up with ten slightly different yeah, haircuts. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And they'll go from slightly different to radically different. Yeah. <laughs> Short back and sides. I've got no back and sides. <laughs> yeah. Where's it gone? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, if you don't yeah. know a number and you say short, yeah. short to what one person yeah, is short yeah. to, you know. Yeah. No, you know I love some people say it to me. They go, uh, how short do you want the back and sides? As short as you can go. And I go, well, the shortest I can go is actual skin <laughs> and no hair at all, you know. Yellow duster and some yeah. pledge level. And they go, oh no, about a three. You go, that's not short. <laughs> yeah. You know, people, yeah, it's quite a, a jump, people's, isn't it? People's <laughs> understanding of extremes, yeah. isn't it? You know, I, I'll give you a final one of that example. Um, a guy who's tattooed me a number of times used to have a store in, in used to work at a store in, uh, in, in Derby of all places. And he, um, he, I was in there getting tattooed and another guy was saying that um, at the time, that George Clooney mo movie, Dust Till Dawn, hadn't been long out. Oh, okay. Well, and all the that. way, and all the way in the through the film, George Clooney had had this suit jacket on with this white vest, and he had this black piece of tribal right up here on his yeah. neck, 
and then a black piece of tribal right DNA on his hand. And at the very end of the movie, when he walks out into the daylight and he takes that now dusty blooded jacket off and he throws it into the back of his car, he's wearing a vest and you realise that what's there is the thing that goes all the way up to the neck. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the tattooer said to me, uh, he said, people come in all the time and ask for uh, the Dust Till Dawn tattoo. And I and I go, oh, really? He said, uh, yeah. And then they would say, but don't take it down to the hand and don't take it all the way up to the neck. And he used to say, less Dust Till Dawn and more breakfast till lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. But you would, though, wouldn't you? Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, obviously, for a certain time, you couldn't have tattoos all over your face. No, no. It affected your job chances, which is bizarre. But... Um, but, but yeah, going, going back to the other metal thing is, I think they are a bit more. Um, there's a bit more structure, a bit better briefs, and I know one of the guys that's there running it. Um, I'm again not going to name drop anyone, but um, I've always respected him as a painter. Yeah. And he he's very much like doesn't. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with non-metallic metals, but it, it's like for him it's a frivolous thing. It's just like base coat, shade, highlight, highlight. You can make amazing looking models from those things. Yeah. And he's d- driven a lot of. I think that that in the team and obviously you've got other people that are doing different things like for, I think for a long time they were missing and this used to frustrate me because we used to get this when we were in the I, and I can say this now and I'm, I'm not bothered about it but as the army painters we never copied the stuff that they did on the box cover we always did a variant colour scheme yeah because there's no way of copying it they've used mad colours and it's so time consuming and it's time and also it's like it, that, that that's uh, they've almost got a small collection anyway like a um a strike force or like a battle force or something like that yeah. so it, that's fine as its own thing so How, we'd, we'd always pick another colour scheme that's just to put it into perspective for um, for the viewers say when you were there um, would you do what to do? I think you told us on the last show you do like a couple of marines in a day yeah, yeah. how long does an heavy metal painter get to do a marine uh, you know what I can't remember I think sometimes it was like one every two days but that might have been shortened down oh, right. wow. um, but it was when we were doing stuff for data sheets we used to put a bit more time into them but actually if you're doing some dry brushing you could probably do like five in a in a day and a bit something mm-hmm. like that but when we were doing all the edge highlight marines and certainly to train like new guys coming in like getting things highlighted if you can highlight a space marine especially a black space marine you can probably do anything yeah um so that was always a good way of like training someone's like always the job interview was painting an ultramarine and seeing their highlights and how they even the again giving them a list of colors and how different people approach that when they send the models in and um, was always very interesting but yeah i can't really remember some of the i mean a, a prime example was the varangard chaos knights the big one i think it was like 11 days for every metal painter wow. to paint that so it's it, but, you know, they invest the time because it's going on the front of the packaging. So. It's funny because I think I, that's where I'm very, very similar to the heavy metal team painters is that I paint in about that a length of time or something, I would, <laughs> but without the results. Yeah, 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 yeah. Roughly 11 days to get to it, <laughs> but still wouldn't look at anything yeah. like that at the end of it. Yeah, so it's... Um, so, um, I suppose my next question really would be then, once you moved from there, and went into into painting for YouTube. Mm. Did you did you like the lack of uh, running people? And 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 did you enjoy, did you like the lack? I don't want to say lack of responsibility. So shall I give you the? You had a lot of responsibility yeah. to put in your own. I tell you what killed me as a manager. Yeah. Um, for um, I loved managing the army painters. Really enjoyed it. Great team. Um, I think we we worked together. I can't remember if it was like two to three years, probably longer. Mm-hmm. It, does, it feels a lot, it, was, it certainly feels like it was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But I'll probably end up finding out it was only like a, two years, but it felt longer. Yeah. They were a great team, all of them were. I mean, we, we went through a couple of different people, like through probation, some didn't quite make it, some, some did all right. Did you have many that go up? Oh, yeah. Uh, the people went to a whole bunch. So Natalie, Slynn, and Paul Norton went to Heavy Metal. Uh, Steve and Tom were what I called my right and left hand men. They they were like quality controllers. They've been they they were good at writing briefs because they got to a point where I had ten painters to worry about, three photographers, and a whole photography studio, uh, which I'll come to in a minute. But getting the three photographers from the um, what is the books and game books and box game studio working with the painters made a lot of sense because whatever we painted, they were photographing. Yeah. So you could find out what their needs are um, and they can riff off with us like, oh, it'd be really cool if you could do like 
these characters we don't need the main like we don't need Gulliman painting because we will use heavy metal as Gulliman there's no point yeah. in painting the second one like, but it'd be really cool to have a conversion of this guy some low level scenery because they used to really like low level scenery to high bases put a lot of smoke in there so when you had those guys in the meetings with the guy with, with the painters and you, we're talking about what we're going to do and they're tricking some ideas that was really helpful um, and sometimes like I said in the previous uh, chat some people will be doing Age of Sigma, some people doing 40k, some will be doing something completely random, making a board or whatever. But having the insight of those photographers and also what they use those models for, because sometimes you'd be put a lot of effort into something and it only gets one shot. So you'd be like, ah, okay, so if they're only going to go into one photo, you know what, we'll just do one or two that are really nice and the rest will just bash yeah. out a bunch to go in the background, especially if they're getting covered in smoke. Why waste time on something that's not going to get used? But you could still paint it so it looks like a nice squad that can be used further down the line for battle reports and yeah stuff. yeah um so that was fine that was manageable i enjoyed that learning a lot about photography as well so i remember that the photographers had a bit of a not i wouldn't say bad reputation but certainly there was a lot of what was deemed slacking in in the studio they were and they just had a lot of work to do mm -hmm. and i then thought you know what i've been asked to keep an eye on them manage them and improve their their speed and their capability I went into the photography student and it became quite apparent that they had a lot of work to do and there was a lot of, I guess, not red tape, but things which made their life harder. So, for instance, like um, Chris Merrick, really top lad, he had a double page shot. So he had all these different types of shots for a, a, a Keridex or an army book. He'd have data sheets or war scroll ones where you'd have like little shots here. Yeah. What they could do was set up a little set, put a squad in, do a cool photo, put another squad in, do a cool photo, move a couple of bits, put a squad in, do a cool photo. They could probably do like a hundred or so of those in a day Yeah. because they've just done one setup and they're just putting different squads in there to, if it was like a tank, they'd have to like build up the set a bit more so you could fit a tank. Yeah, in yeah, there. I understand. So they could like do, we could do a hundred data sheets in a day. And then you had half page shots, which was a bit more like a scenic shot, mm -hmm. um, full page shots, which were again, a, a close in scenic shot with a lot more stuff going off behind it. And the thing that, again, I didn't discover, because I was like, I need to find out why it takes so long to, for a double page shot, because they're like five days for a big, what they call DPS, double page shot, which yeah. went across. And on that shot, you probably have anywhere between two to 500 figures in shot. So the thing that I was like, Chris, talk me through how, it, how you go about setting up a shot, then, because I don't know anything about this. And he's like, well, there's a lot of things to consider. You, there's the stacking. So they set up a load of stuff at the back first, take some shots, and they set stuff in front of it, take some shots, then they set some stuff in front of that, take some shots, and then all those shots that are then done, they compile into one mm -hmm. shot, so it's it's not as like blurry. So you're still getting, it blurs at the back, but it's not as mad mm -hmm. as a blur. But then there's the other thing of like the, the depth of field. So you'd set up a guy here, and the guy in the shot would look really close to him, but he's not, he is there. Yeah, miles away, but he looks in that shot really close, and then every time he's got to look, for, he's got to go back. Once he's set up a guard, look through the the viewfinder. Oh, I saw that guns in the way of his face because there's a thing like don't have the guns in front of people's faces. There's all these sort of rules and regulations we had of like photos of like this could get in the way. Don't have models going into the gutter, which is the bit in the middle of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I learned a lot from photography just by sitting with these guys and looking through the processes, and I was like. Yeah, you need five days for a double page shot, especially if you're being asked to do like anything between 500 models, 200 models or something like that. And I like suppose that. as well as you, to some degree as well as the problem we've got is that because um, in this hobby, some would say we can be a bit pinnicky about, oh, yeah. Yeah, about things. You go, well, why have they got the, the assault marines right at the back of the thing? Yeah, yeah, you've got to yeah. figure, it's got to, have a narr it's got to narratively make sense for how the army functions, yeah. isn't it, as well? And the, think, there's the, the, the tough bit with that. It's not just the narrative side of it, why a thing is here, why a thing is there. There's all the markings. So when we've done, like, an, I did the Imperial Guard Army with a couple of guys, we called it the 92nd, and they, like, got dark green jackets, beige trousers. No, no, beige jackets, dark green trousers with, like, yellow stripes on them, and then we did, like, a slightly different tone of green. But they all look the same. Yeah. But they're all they're all marked differently, and it used to trigger me so much when, like, one photographer's rushed off his feet, and you'd have like squad one one eight, but in there was squad member five oh six. You're like, what's he doing you know, in the no, squad? That would that would kill oh. me. That would kill me. So I we ended up like painting big colours on the bottom of the bases <laughs> to try and help out. There was all sorts of things. We'd even like magnetise like sections in a in a very useful box. So that's that squad. That's that squad. That's that squad. 
it just happens things just get mixed up especially yeah. when someone's rushing they've got so much to do and the other thing as well is like model breakages were quite prevalent yeah and i i would still and i had a lot of conversations when i was the photography manager which was we used to get a lot of um, conversations with the heavy metal managers going you got, your photographers keep breaking stuff they're not handling them. they need to have a, like a, a man handling session it was, like, it was a bit patronizing they don't have to pick up a model yeah um sometimes however they were right to say that because the way i've seen some of the people handle models is atrocious <laughs> it's like no wonder it breaks. Yeah, <laughs> the way you're holding it. Put onto the boards with a dustpan and brush. Yeah. Just like, oh, but when you're rushed, <laughs> when and I, and I, th- I think as well that, that there is, uh, and I did an example which was, I can pick up this model that I've super glued together and I can throw it to the other side of the room and it won't break. Yeah, it was it was a ballsy moment to to, to prove that. But I did it. Yeah, and it didn't break. And I was like, heavy metal don't glue their things particularly well. That's why when mm-hmm. they reach over to grab a model and pick it up by its base because we've been asked to pick them up by the base, they might accidentally catch, catch the spear up, yeah. and the spear will just pop off. Yeah. It didn't take two seconds to glue it. But there was sort of that, that balance between massive workload, models that could be glued a little bit, have a little bit more glue on them and carelessness. And the weird thing is, is every now and again, something gets through, doesn't it? There was a codex or a picture from something not that long ago that made it to final shot. And there was a Space Marine, I think it was a Space Marine's arm coming away and there was blue tackle. Uh, yeah, and yeah, it made yeah. it into the... Because it's the weapon options. You'd have like different weapon yeah, options. Yeah, so you'd the swap blue them over, on, yeah. yeah. And it kind of went into shot was this... And I know this, why that would have happened. Because they would have spent ages doing the shot, kept checking the viewfinder. Yeah. The, that that Because of the light of the, the heat. The heat, the heat of the light yeah, would, well, um, would have just made that do that. And if you're not paying attention, you just, you've just you solved that section over there and now you're worrying about this section. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't even fall on your radar. Yeah. So I can see how it happens. And we used to get like proofs printed out and it would go through it and there'd be lots of notes on it going reshoot, reshoot. Some of the times I'd be like, I'm not reshooting for that. That's yeah. that's like two days worth of work. We're not, we'll just, because the great thing, the difference between video and photography is you can Photoshop photography. Yeah, yeah, of course. Video is a little bit harder. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I understood why things took a lot longer. There were some processes that could speed up a little bit and also from what was being asked of the photographers could be reduced down a bit sometimes as well because like you'd, you'd have like, you guys sat on the chairs in the in the studio going, yeah, I want this army with this big shot against this big army and I want that army. They've got no sense of reality of how that would look. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I think you probably, especially with the where things are massively creative, is it, it does become, all them teams become a bit partisan, don't yeah, they? And, yeah. and then they don't really know, understand, they don't understand what each other, what yeah. each other does, you know, and, it's, and, it, you, you, and I think that, you know, I think in, in certain, areas of business in certain companies it's very obvious what the other one does but i would imagine when like i say there's a creativity element that's thrown yeah. into it it becomes quite easy to not understand you understand your creative bit but you don't understand so i'd say the the best times of studio and mm-hmm. whether that was like managing or being a staff member because it was like a crossover bit was that we had two managers we had a studio manager and like the like the head of the design studio. Um, I don't know the difference between the two jobs. One was like head honcho, one was like on yeah. thing. But there's a guy called um, Ben Fawcett. He no, no longer works with us, it's a shame. And then um, uh, Max Bottler, who's still at the business doing stuff. But they used to sit in the teams and like do a little bit of hobby, a little bit of chat, but understood what each team did. Yeah. And there became a time when no one did that again. Mm-hmm. So from my experience of like not knowing anything about, anything about photography and just... I could have gone in there with judgments going, you guys are really lazy and don't pull your finger out very often. Or you could spend a day with one of them and then yeah. discover why things take so long and go, oh, okay. And then you can start thinking about how can we change process? How can we make your job easier? Not like slacking easy, but just like, if we want photos faster, what can we do to make that happen? Maybe not put 500 figures on the table. You know, that's going to help. Smoke can cover a lot of a multitude of sins, but there's only so much it, it can do. Before you can't control and, you know, where the smoke goes. And you know, and that, and I, and I think that is a good thing. You know, we, my, um, my regiment when when I was in the army, we had quite a progressive command and officer, and he things like was like, if you call for mortars to be firing on that thing, and they need to be set up, and you're then going, why? What's going on? You know, they would send people who may well be the guys calling on mortar platoon to be doing doing their job to go and work with mortars for a couple of weeks yeah. to see how long yeah. it takes them to set yeah. up. If you go, 
well, you know, why couldn't reconnaissance platoon figure that out when they went forward? Why figure weren't they able to see yeah, that? You go and they'll explain, you know, come and get on board and see how close you can get or see what our cameras can do or this does or whatever. And, you you know, I think that thing of, like, pushing someone into the bit that that needs them, yeah. that, that that they need, is it gives them a little bit of an understanding of the yeah. thing. And I think the idea of that, of, like... Well, you, hanging around with other teams it could in a weird way Workshop used to do that they used to have a thing called Games Workshop 101 and I think it was such a great obviously with all the NDAs and all the secrecy now mm -hmm. behind like the, the production stuff it's it, it's more of a barrier now as opposed to being a, a useful so what you'd do is you'd go through the journey of a model Yeah. so you'd go down into miniatures and you'd watch like the sculptors it, it was literally like a day sort of um, just a, not a day of like jollies but you went through all the different departments that existed in Games Workshop and worked yeah. out how things are done because there's always going to be you know that conversation going oh things are taking ages in our sample order what are they doing sitting on their bum all day doing nothing until you actually go that one day on your games workshop one on one and see the packing see the blister packs being done yeah see it all being packed that and that whole journey and process from like a drawing to a render on a screen to how it's tooled in the tooling to how it's like manufactured and printed to how it's like put into the warehouse to how it's then shipped out of the warehouse mm -hmm. and that whole journey back again into the store it's like oh yeah it's quite profound actually i should just wind my neck in and shut up a bit yeah absolutely right um, it's, it's it's i think it's very easy to there be in your bubble and not think yeah. about how the other bubbles are working isn't yeah. it you know Every, everyone's a cog in the machine and, and I, I do think sometimes people think that their cob is the most important cog yeah. in that in that yeah, and that's just human i think on some levels that's just human nature well you it? will do because you, you become like self-centric in that zone you just yeah like, what we do is really important it's like yeah but everything is important you're just another cog in a machine um, so so then when you left um army painter and then went over to um to youtube yeah to go we were talking about this i was on this just before was how did that feel to go from not having a team to worry about but you you became more self -ma it was more a case of yeah. self-managing then yeah. really wasn't it i think all the years of managing you you have to be humble about everything you do and, and know that you're going to make mistakes and know that you're going to mess stuff up and how you go about dealing with that situation whether that's with staff or not and up to that point i'd done a lot of these academy sessions which is a really good thing which again doesn't happen so much these days but you, you do a lot of academy courses on like questioning listening take keeping score taking action and all that information over the years just made me a little bit more self-aware of every action i did whether that's on screen or like planning so i'd make my own little schedule i'd write down and i'd have my processes it, obviously it took me a couple of months to get those processes in line because i you know it was a very different job from painting armies to painting one figure for tv i'd never scripted a script before i'd never painted in front of a camera before so a lot of it was like trial and error on the first few weeks just to go like right I'm just going to paint the Stormcast because I painted a few of those recently. I should really have prepped this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what 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 am I saying? What am I what am I trying, what am I picking at? But a lot of the principles of army painting was useful because yeah. I could break down how I, the process of how I, I can make paint the model easy from the lowest section of a model to the highest section. You know, undercoating it one colour, washing it, dry brushing, it, and then picking out all the other areas. All those things were just, I guess, very much normal processes to me up to this point. well i think that's um me and pat when we were recording uh an episode recently we got talking about it was the fact that we were saying that now that we've pat's recorded you mm. doing a lot of material and i've watched all that material um we were saying that one of the things that is interesting is your your speed comes from a, a well-defined yeah. process and your understanding of what colour can sit next to that or what colour can do that job but also that job and the fact that you've made it as efficient as possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I think I think that's the really interesting bit because I think, and obviously that's massively useful for when you went on to, to YouTube for GW, is that understanding of just how it all goes together which i think is like when you're a casual painter you can sort of wander your way around the miniature and then yeah, get a yeah, bit lost yeah. in it and then but i think so I mean, i've been there i've done that where i've just like sat and painted the model casually and just gone i should have planned this out yeah 
because it just goes horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, I think it that bit of having to train yourself and to be able to do that, because obviously the problem um, is Games Workshop have a particular amount of time they want that, that yeah. video to be, don't they? Yeah, you know? yeah. and, it's, and, and being able to think, can I get all of that in, I think is quite... I think it's quite fascinating to think of it that way. Yeah, I mean, as well, um, like when I work with Duncan and also with the uh, the newer guys, everyone has a different way of working or a different process. And although I I think the way I do things is an efficiency base, it doesn't always mean it's the right way to do stuff. And even now, I like go if I was to do that again, I'd do this or yeah. I'd do that. And I think that's a great thing about painting. There's always something as a painter myself. There's always something I can learn from doing the the, the project. Um, or different ways I could have approached it, or different colours I could have used instead of that red, I could have used that red, or I could have just not used any reds at all, or whatever. Um, but I, I certainly think I learnt a lot from the eye painting and managing to then do the job I, I, I did there. And the managing thing was more like personal time management. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also making myself accountable for when I make mistakes and how I go about dealing with those. Um, but yeah, because unfortunately you didn't have members of staff you could blame. No, no. And that's that. So the biggest, my biggest bugbear, um, or my, my biggest fault, was sometimes I'd be so invested in like planning a suite of videos that I'd forget to order the stuff. Oh, right. So then I'd have to go to the store and get some bits. Oh, and sometimes it wasn't always down to me forgetting. It was like just because things took a while to, mm -hmm. to turn up. But I think of all my biggest weaknesses when it came to doing like my presenting kind of stuff, obviously presenting itself was like something I had to learn over time but yeah just remember there are other things that you need to do and just putting like things into my little schedule that I made was like don't forget to order the thing don't forget to order the thing um, because it used to take about five to ten days for a sample order to turn up oh wow so if I'd forgot to order it and, and it's tomorrow I'll be like stress I forgot <laughs> to order it um, but that was just something that to, to learn and even now um, Luckily, Pat buys things because he's good like that. But I have loads of stuff at home, so I've always got back up. <laughs> got a little bit behind us. Got well, a little bit behind just, us. Just yeah. one or two little bits there as well. <laughs> but when you've got so much going off, there is there is that danger that something so, will slip. If we looked at the most, I won't say worst, because I think that's a bad way of putting it. Most difficult times of managing is being under the cosh of the sales and yeah. and and having that on you all the time. And Games Workshop, as you say, taking that step towards being more sales driven and, yeah, and, yeah. and a little bit less hobby driven. Yeah. What would you say would just be your standout bit then? Would it be managing the at the, the painters? Yeah, I'd say so. Because um, it was a great team and we had a lot of fun, but we still we were professional. Yeah. We used to have something called Power Valid Friday where we were in a little room. And it was probably safe for the rest of the studio, to be fair. Yeah. We closed the door and we just stick power ballads on. There was National Anthem Friday where we just played every single possible National <laughs> Anthem across the world. Some of them were all very samey as well, which is quite interesting. <laughs> but then we'd have like, you know, Country and Western Friday. We'd, we'd mix Did it you up. know when Country and Western Friday did productivity just really stop? Oh, yeah, off. yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Egyptian death metal, you know, yeah. why not? Did like, did, did, did like Acid House Wednesdays, did everyone produce about 12 miniatures a day instead of the two that was required? <laughs> Acid house Wednesdays that, that was something different in the studio yeah I bet it was yeah <laughs> <laughs> well I think that's gave us a bit more of a, a an insight into what goes on from especially like say from working from store all the way through the creative elements and then into a personal creative element there I think I think that's I think it's very, it's very easy to just look on the outside and look in a games workshop and just think you understand how it all yeah. works and it really doesn't like I, th I, I think, think as as a kid yeah. And even now, if I I love Lego, right? Yeah. Lego's great. It's amazing. Oh, of course it's I'd love to, I've always wanted to work for Lego. If there's anybody watching this who doesn't think Lego's amazing. Yeah, What's wrong think, with you? Yeah, you're on the <laughs> <laughs> But I always had this I, I, second love would be to work for Lego. But after working in the studio, and it's amazing from the outside. Yeah. But it's a job from the inside. Yeah. And absolutely. there's gonna be good days and bad days. There's gonna be disenchanting days. There's gonna be days where like this is the best thing in the world. It's reality versus the sort of expectation. 
And I know, like, oh, I'd really love to work for Lego because they just sit and build Lego models all day. Yeah, no, go. no. they don't. Because once you start working in the Lego design studio, oh, it will be the same as like any other design studio. Well, I world. remember building, um, I remember I've got the uh, Ultimate Collector Series Slave 1. Oh, nice. And, you know, and I remember building it and just thinking, how much effort of building all of these things that structurally never get seen. Oh, yeah. On the external yeah. model of yeah. going, how hard where, where, that, I mean, How do you start that? And also, there's the thing as well as like their processes, they've probably got like a massive tight deadline. Yeah. They, they're they relying on old builds that you used to use to do like this thing. Because sometimes I used to watch a lot of these like um, reviews of like Lego kits and stuff like that. And you do get like the person going, this is just pretty much the same build as this one, just with like a slightly different mask. It's like, yeah. Probably because they had no time to make it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, being on that side, but yeah, you know, they're like their ultramarines, but on a different base. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there is. You know, we could argue that sometimes we we reskin things, but then you know, it is getting that content out for people to. Yeah, because if you don't well. reskin them, people will complain that there's nothing coming out. Yeah, and it's it's, you know, yeah. It, it, it's, it's you're always going to find, I think, with um, creative hobbies. Lego, uh, you know, what we do and, and Games Workshop and all of that sort of thing. I think we are probably some of the most difficult people to please. Cause, yeah. Because I think we have that double problem, isn't it, is, is that we want new things, but we also don't want anything to change at the same time, <laughs> don't we, you know. I think and, there's a, a, a just something to add to, to like my experience yeah. that I've, I, I've come to over the years is I am a creative. I was a manager for a time. And then I manage creatives. Being a creative that manages creatives doesn't always make for the best manager. I like to think I did an okay job. No, yeah. one, no one complained and no one left. But certainly the business and a lot of businesses out there have a lot of non-creatives managing creatives. And I think sometimes that's where you get like those weird schisms of like yeah. a, a non-creative, like, we just need this thing doing, where the creative's like, but it needs to be like this. And <laughs> we need more flowers on the side like this. It's like, no, just get it out there and get it done. And sometimes the creatives can feel a bit stifled. Yes. So it's, it's that managing of, of someone's ability to make stuff, but also getting it over the line and made into a product. And I think there's a lot of, in the last probably like five or six years, a lot of people that are getting a bit jarred about that, like, but I like to make my own thing. Yeah. I remember for a time, actually, we used to scratch build a lot of scenery. Yeah. And we were told, you're no longer using bolster wood, you're no longer using fem card, you're using the Citadel products we make because we yeah. make them. A few people were like, um, I'm out because mm -hmm. you've stifled my creativity. And it's just like, it's kind of more creative trying to make something different yeah. from that. In yeah, fact, yeah. I'd say that's, that's a lot more creativity. So, yeah, I think certainly in the last few years, having... Being a creative that manages, I understand creatives, but yeah, you get those non-creatives that don't understand creatives, which makes a bit of a... <laughs> but people are getting there. We're getting yeah. there. It takes time. I well, say we're getting there. I'm not there anymore. <laughs> they're, getting there. Yeah, they're getting there. We're getting there, but in, a, in our yeah. own. Are you a creative? Would you say you're a creative? Well, I would say, uh, yeah, I suppose I am. I suppose I'd have to say I was a creative because... You know, I you cut hair. I cut hair, and as, as daft as that sounds, people come in looking one way, and they want to go out looking a different way. You know, they 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 come in looking like they've been living under a bridge, and they want to go out looking like somebody who plays for Real Madrid. What, what about but, me? What can you do for me? Um, I think keeping it short, I think, is probably the best. <laughs> best course of Not action. a big old K moment. No, no, no I, think, I think I uh, think I think if you kept coming in and then saying things, I think you know, um, you might be pushing my. Career. What was if I grew my hair out? Well, we could. Could you do stuff with that? Yeah, we could make me Keith Flint, you, you know, prodigy. Cool. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, shaved out through the top, like a reverse mohawk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Big clean bit in the middle, yeah, all on the sides. sides. What yeah. do you think? I think that might, that might be a show in the in the making. I think further down the Just line. Cut my hair whilst I paint toy soldiers. Yeah, yeah. See, there we go. Yeah, I'll pass well, anyway, for you. well, anyway, as we know, and all the viewers now know, Pat's naked again, and he's helicoptering away behind yeah. the camera, which is what, wrap up. Wrap why? Up. Why was it olive oil today and not baby oil? I don't. Oh, understand. I think I think I think they're having. Um, I think and the girlfriend are having an Italian meal for dinner. Uh, okay. I think he just wants to try the smell out, see how the, what the aroma of it was like. Yeah, it's very, it's very olivey. Yeah. <laughs> you should have been here on when we used to have uh, Rosemary Oil Thursdays. That was a wonder. <laughs> what are oh. we doing to ourselves? Pat? What are we doing? Oh, I don't know. Why do we do this to you? Just before we wrap up, you yes. said, shall I say, what killed me as a manager? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, oh, sorry. Yes, uh, what actually killed you as a manager? In, in the army painting team. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't the army painters. It wasn't the... Um, 
it wasn't the army painters and it wasn't the photographers. What it actually was, was we, I was managing the uh, photographer studio. Yeah. And the studio itself had seven, six, seven different teams in it. Okay. I, I wasn't allowed to manage a single one of those teams, apart from the books and box game guys. But I had all the stress of all their problems. I had no budget. But each department had a budget. So when a camera broke, we had to rely on someone to, to fix it. And you'd be like, this team would like, well, it's not our problem. We're not using that camera. It's not our problem. It's not our camera. Oh. But you broke it. Yeah, but it's not our problem. It's not, our, it's not part of our budget. So after about, I think, two, three years of that, I was just like, I've had enough. Mm. I just, I don't need this extra stress of like managing people I can't manage, solving their problems, but not being able to afford or pay for those problems. And the worst bit was we had, I think, five setups, but like six, seven teams. So you'd have to like always juggle around these different people. And for a time it was quite fun, but then it just got very tedious. Yeah then quite irritating yeah and then to the point where like can someone help me i literally have no budget i have people screaming down my ears because they have cameras that don't work none of you none of you want to pay for it yeah and you're telling us we're having to reduce our camera setups from this amount to this amount because a health and safety issue with wires when i've already done this quote for like this high glide system which no, no one wants to pay for but would solve all of that. We'll get more camera setups in there. Well, it's just a problem once the rot sets in. Right. You try to <laughs> so, you I mean, pull yourself out the other side of yeah, it. Yeah, I was literally, I had like a thimble and the, and the boat was singing. I'm like, come on, <laughs> come on. It's not <laughs> working. And I just thought, and I think as well, it was like a knowledge thing. I just didn't know enough about cameras to, yeah. to one, care enough to, to solve it. Because I didn't know anything about like, because people like go, this camera's broken. Uh, can you go and get it fixed? Where? Yeah. <laughs> anything about getting it fixed i just rely on someone telling me a phone number and i'd ring them up and go we've got a broken camera can you fix it yeah four months later it finally gets fixed uh -huh. so i was just like it's just too much and then the job came up with duncan i was like i like painting i miss, I miss painting i think i could have if that job never came up, i would have stuck to it yeah, I probably yeah. found a way around it because i was doing a pitch to make it a, a photographer studio in its own right where you get work in everyone's like part of the same team and you get work in but that never came to fruition but it just killed me Killed me both enthusiastically and just like motivationally. I was just like, oh, life's too short. I can't. I'm literally solving everyone's problems and getting no relief. But yeah. that's the job of the manager, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm no one so. likes you. No one hates you. <laughs> but everyone needs you. <laughs> but everyone needs you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, keeping us on track there, Pat. I'm much appreciated because uh, as I, with the we amount waffled. of questions I've been firing away, I've got lost. <laughs> Thank you very much been a bit of a leap in subscribers and watching mm. and hours it's done rather well since you've turned up hasn't it it has and you know why do you know why it's done well because you need to hit that like and subscribe button oh that was slick oh i'm gonna have a go i'm yeah, absolutely i'm gonna have a go now we've got a patreon we do and it's got loads of stuff yeah and tuition with me oh and discord and and you can poll you can poll. i don't know why i'm looking as if it's like a small hole but i am i'm looking if it's a small oh, it is. hole this is like a small hole it's yeah small and hole. You oh can... he's turned around it uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> he should warn us and also you can have your miniatures rated can't you you can you, you yes i can uh, give you feedback on miniatures uh which if you want it it's uh, useful to to get some like, oh, oh, tuition I've got, I've got another one there's a discord there's <laughs> We also have some affiliate links in the description as well. Oh, we do. One for Element Games and a German one, That's, or Continental, as we like to say. It's got so. about nine letters. You'll see it's down it's there. It's more than nine. It ends in DE. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for subbing. It's been amazing to see how it's gone since Peachy's been on board. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.